Um, but this morning, um, we're continuing in our series, uh, Lord, Teach Us to Pray. And man, I can't think of a more important series um, right now than learning to pray, learning to connect more with God. And prayer should be a lifestyle, not an emergency last resort. A lot of times we kind of look at prayer as it's going to rescue us from a situation we're already in, and I'm not taking anything away from that. If you're in an emergency situation, definitely pray. But sometimes we look in an emergency as prayer being the, the rescue or, or God get us out of this when a constant lifestyle of prayer maybe could have kept us out of that emergency situation. And I'm not saying that if you constantly pray, your life is going to be perfect. We have no guarantee of that. But I am saying, I bet it'll be better. <laughs> I bet your life will go smoother if you have this constant lifestyle of prayer. And I've heard from many of you that, you know, you, you have this constant prayer and you have these blessings like you go to the store and there's a parking place, you know, right there for you. Or, or um, you, you um, avoid heavy traffic like, wow, there should be so much more traffic than this. But I prayed and, and uh, there wasn't as much traffic. And, and those are great. I'm not taking anything away from those. But this week, I had a much more intense one um, that happened um, because I am constantly praying, um, God, put me in the right place at the right time. Put me in situations where I can help others. Make things work out for the benefit of those you have called me to, to touch and to reach. So I'm constantly praying for, you know, God to orchestrate situations. And this week, um, I was pulling out of my um, uh, a complex, townhouse complex, and there's two entries and exits, and I always go out this one. I mean, I don't know if anybody else is a creature of habit, but I am such a creature of habit. I constantly do the same thing. So I'm always going out this one. But for some reason, I don't know why, I went out the other entrance and, and um, I'm, I'm getting ready to pull out on the main street and, you know, now school is back um, in. So I'm always careful, but especially when school is letting out, I'm super cautious to watch the sidewalk, you know, see if there's anybody coming. And since I was pulling out this other entrance, I wasn't you know, quite used to it, so I'm being extra cautious, and, and I'm going to take a right, so I look on the sidewalk, nobody coming, I look to the left, and there's a car that's coming, and I mean, like right on me, so I could have turned as soon as they went by, and, and so they're going by, and just as I was about to pull out, I see another car had taken a right, so my normal your response is, I would just gun it, right, <laughs> and, get, and get going, you know, and, and I could have easily done it and not made them slow down or anything, but for some reason, I thought, no, nah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wait, so this all happened very quickly, so check the sidewalk, car coming, oh, another one's coming, I'll wait, and the minute I turned around, out of nowhere, these two middle school girls are right in front of my car. If I would have gone, I would have hit them. I don't know where they came from. There, there's a, a hedge, you know, on this side. Maybe they were behind it hiding from some of their friends or I don't know what. But just all of a sudden they were there. And, I mean, I'm getting queasy in my stomach just thinking about it now. I would have hit them. And I think this is one of those situations where we're in constant prayer and we don't understand why we just have that don't go, don't, don't go yet. And so I didn't go and of course, thank God didn't hit them. But, but those are situations that I think 
a lifestyle of prayer keeps us out of a world of trouble. How many of you know it's much easier for me to have a lifestyle of prayer and avoid a situation like that than praying for them after I hit them? Man, a constant lifestyle of prayer is so vital. So here is the foundation for this series. Um, We've gone over this a lot, and we will go over it more and more in this series. This is Jesus talking. In John 15, 4 through 5, it says, Remain in me, and I will remain in you. Of course, we've learned remain, abide. It's kind of the same. um, uh, That same word can be defined as both those. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. What is the natural thing for a branch to do coming off of a grapevine? Produce grapes, right? That, that's what it naturally does if it stays connected. Jesus is saying, and you cannot be fruitful. You cannot produce or do what you've been created to do unless you remain in me. Then he says, yes, I am the vine. He's saying the purpose of this parable, the purpose of this story that I'm telling you, he's not saying I'm literally the vine. He's saying, yes, in this story, I am represented by the vine. I am the vine. You are the branches. Those who remain or abide in me and I am them, will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, again, this is not saying you can't do nothing, like get out of bed in the morning. It's talking about the purpose of the branch is to produce fruit. So you cannot do nothing according to your purpose, what I've created you for, unless you stay connected with the mind. Now, we went super deep in this two weeks ago, but probably deeper than I've ever gone teaching on this particular passage. But the depth that we went was to show the simplicity of it. And sometimes we make this so complicated But it's really just saying the way to produce what God has created you for is simply staying connected with him. I mean, you've never seen a branch like trying to push out some fruit, right? It just doesn't happen. They don't do that. The branch produces fruit not by effort, but by connection. So all we have to do is not try to produce fruit. We just have to (laughs) stay connected, right? We just have to stay plugged in to the vine. We don't have to try. We just have to stay connected to him because everything flows out of that connection with him. So he's saying he's our source of life. He's where we get the stuff, the nutrients or whatever you want to call it that flows out of the the vine to the branch. That's where we get that stuff is from connection with him. We thrive because of our connection with him. So how do we stay connected with him? Prayer. We stay connected with Jesus through communication or prayer with him. So that's why in this series we're focusing on prayer. And some of the things that we have learned so far, we learned that it doesn't matter that we are talking to someone we can't see. How many of you remember that was the elephant in the room, right? We, we, we all know that, but we don't like to talk about it. We like to just pretend, you know, that it's not weird that we're talking to somebody we can't see. 
Well, it is weird, right? Because it's not normal for us. So we have to get more accustomed to it. And, and the reason that it works is because God is spirit and we were created in his image. So we were created as spirit. We have this spiritual being that can connect with him as a spirit. So we have this spiritual connection with God. And it's not spooky. Sometimes we think spiritual must be spooky. You know, we don't have to talk in this super spiritual voice, you know, when we're talking to God. Like, spiritual has to be spooky. No, spiritual is normal. It's the way we're, we were created. It's the way we, we were designed to have this connection with God. And then we saw these pillars of prayer. Um, some of them we're not going to um, go over but, but a couple of them I want to just review a little bit and add some stuff to them. And these pillars not only make prayer effective, but they make prayer enjoyable. And the first one is that God loves to, to, for me to, whoops, <laughs> we got overheated, I guess. So uh, you'll just have to trust me that, that uh, it would have been up there. So God loves me to talk to him about anything. God just enjoys it. He digs it. He loves communicating with us. Does anybody else have a kid that the only time you hear from them is maybe a birthday and Father's Day? And when they need something, come on. <laughs> don't do that to God. Don't just communicate him with him on special days or when you need something. Have this relationship um, with God that you have this continual communication with. And it doesn't, again, have to be something spiritual, like ultra spiritual. God is interested in in what you are interested in. His interests are your interests because they came from him. His interests came from you. Let's see how that works. In Psalm 37, four, it says, seek your happiness in the Lord. We, we may be able to turn it back on after, oh, hey, there we go. That's what prayer does right there. <laughs> Seek your happiness in the Lord, and he will give you your heart's desire. Now, some say, well, does he place the desire in you, or does he grant the desire that you already have? And I want to say both. The line between granting you the desire and placing the desire in you gets very blurred. They kind of become the same. And, you know, when you're in the Lord, those lines are very blurred. They become the same. Now, some people may say, well, my desires don't seem very godly. <laughs> well, let me ask you a question. Are you seeking your happiness outside the Lord or in the Lord? Are you seeking your happiness in the Lord or outside the Lord? This is so important. I don't know if I could say enough about this. See, there's lots of things that make me happy in life. Being in the gym is one of them, and I know that's not for everybody. Some people say, isn't that painful? Yeah, that's part of what's enjoyable. <laughs> that's why I call the gym the Iron Sanctuary, because it's the one place in my life that I go to and I unpack everything, all the troubles of life, all the challenges that I'm going through, all the distractions. I walk up to the door and I just leave a pile at the door and I walk in and it's just the me and God time. And that's why I call it the Iron Sanctuary because it's this sanctuary where I can just leave my troubles behind temporarily 
Sometimes you have to pick them back up when you leave. But, but, but you can have this time where you don't have these distractions of life. And, and I'm not saying, you know, that it bugs me when people, you know, ask me for prayer. Robert does it. Other people do it in the gym. Hey, Ken, will you pray for me? I love that. That's part of why I'm there. But, but it's also this time where I can just get away from the, the stuff of life. And everyone needs something like that. May not be the gym for you. Maybe riding your Harley, riding your motorcycle. It may be knitting, you know, or crocheting or quilt making or whatever. Everybody needs something like that. But here's the key. I do it in the Lord. It says, seek your happiness in the Lord. I do it in the Lord. Now, what does it mean to do something in the Lord? In is one of those Hebrew words that has about 50 different meanings. Of course, they're all similar. But, but here's the most relevant ones that I think will help us understand what it's talking about. According to, on account of, on behalf of, concerning, beside, and together with. So to do something in the Lord, that word in means all these different things. So when you are doing something in the Lord, you are doing something according to the Lord. When you are doing something in the Lord, you are doing something on account of the Lord. When you're doing something in the Lord, you're doing something on behalf of the Lord. When you're doing something in the Lord, you're doing something concerning the Lord. When you're doing something in the Lord, you are doing something beside the Lord. Now, I'm not taking anything away from Jesus being in us, but when you're doing something in the Lord, it's you and the Lord <laughs> that are doing it, right? He, he's like beside you in a way that, that you're together. And of course, the last one, if you're doing something in the Lord, you are doing something together with the Lord. Tammy was actually sharing with me when she does this, opportunities to minister to people at her work just happen. They, they, there's opportunities that she can bring joy or, or bring happiness into somebody's life when she's doing her work in the Lord. Not so much when she's doing her work to get a paycheck. Come on, somebody. I mean, we can do stuff in life just to get a paycheck, just to, you know, check this box or, you know, do this. But when you do it in the Lord, then these opportunities come to you. And this last one, together with, it reminds me of when I first became a Christian, um, I was um, a bouncer in all the major nightclubs in the Seattle area, all the big big nightclubs, big, big time nightclubs. And um, when I became a Christian, it took me a while to figure out that wasn't where God wanted me to be. And, and when I first became a Christian, um, I became best friends with um, this guy named Doug. And, and Doug loved the Lord, was committed to the Lord, but he was missing something and that something was me. And I was missing having somebody like him because when you have that, you know, that you're in this together and you're, you're both so committed to the Lord and, and we not only encouraged each other, but we were accountable to each other. And I remember this one time, Doug and this other guy, um, I was friends with this other guy, but didn't know him as well. And Doug and this other guy, they were thinking about going into this nightclub. And, and Doug was really, you know, 
not sure, and he was like, and, and he said this, he said, I don't want to take Jesus in there. And, and this other guy said, and, and this is funny in a way, but, but also not funny. This other guy said, we'll leave him out here. And he wasn't kidding. See, that other guy had not yet figured out what it was to do something in the Lord. That you're doing something together with the Lord. And Doug didn't want to take Jesus into that nightclub. So he decided he didn't go. So we all have, you know, things like this. Being with close friends, for me, close friends that I love, they're, it's like family, you know, and a lot of you are my family, you know, because I don't have a lot of family. I have a sister that lives fairly close, but we don't get together that often. So being with you all makes me happy. <laughs> and, and like having dinner at the bosses, it's like, it's like family. It's like being with family. And I do it in the Lord. And here's how I would sum this up. And we're almost done here. Here's how I would sum up doing things in the Lord. It means that you're the same everywhere. No matter what you're doing, you don't have, this is how I act at church, this is how I act at the gym, this is how I act when I'm with my buddies. You don't have that. You're just the same everywhere, no matter what you're doing. The most meaningful Father's Day card that I ever got, and that's saying a lot because my son was really good at writing. He, he most of the time would create his own cards. When he used a pre-made card, what he wrote so overshadowed what was already on the card. And this one Father's Day, he gave me this card, and he said, Dad... You're the same, no matter where you are. And this was a time where Caleb and I did everything together. We went to the gym together. We rode bikes together. When I competed in bodybuilding, he was always with me. We played pickup basketball games together. We did everything together. If I was one way at church and a totally different way in the gym, what would that say to my son? That it's phony, right? It's only real if we're the same no matter where we are. And I think that's what it's talking about when it says that when you seek your happiness in the Lord, God gives you your desires. So your desires come from him. You have shared desires with God. <laughs> you, you have common desires so you can talk about those desires in prayer because you're both into it right i mean your your desire is god's desire you're into it he's into it so you can talk about it in prayer let's look at what it says here in first john chapter 5 verse 14 it says and we are sure of this that he will listen to us whenever we ask him anything in line with his will. 
And if we really know he is listening when we talk to him and make our requests, then we can be what? Sure. We can be sure that he will answer us. So where did your desires come from when you seek your happiness in the Lord? They come from the Lord. That your desires come from Him, from His will. Oh, if, if we could just get this. That when we seek our happiness in the Lord, we get our desires from His will. So when we talk to Him, about our desires, we are asking in his will, right? Because the desire came from him. So when we pray about it, when we ask him, we already know that it's his will because it came from him. Now look at what it says twice in those two verses, that he listens. We know that he is always listening. And the word listen there in the Greek means to attend to, to consider what has been said, to understand, to perceive what the sense of what is being said. Remember the story of Zacchaeus that we talked about a couple weeks ago, two or three weeks ago? And, And it says that Jesus saw him. And it wasn't a word that he was like, whoa, there's a guy up there in the tree. <laughs> you know, like, like Jesus just kind of noticed him and just went on his merry way. No, it meant that he saw him. Saw his need. Saw his um, difficulty. Saw the things that he was going through. Jesus saw him. Well, this word listen here is kind of the same thing. It's not that you know, Jesus just kind of hears us talking, you know, that, that, you know, the sine waves of sound are hitting God's ear and, you know, but he's not really paying attention. No, this word listen here means that he's really connecting with us. Do you realize there's a difference between hearing and listening? Have you ever known somebody that hears and doesn't listen? I knew this pastor, (laughs) I still know him, he's a great guy. But when you talk to him, it's like he's nodding his head, (laughs) he's acting like he's listening, but you can see that he's looking past you to the next person that he's going to have to talk to. Have you guys ever experienced that? If you guys ever experienced that from me, please tell me, because that's not my heart. I don't ever want to do that. I want to listen. I want to connect. So this word in the Greek here, the word akua, tells us that sound is not the sound of our prayers, the sound of our communication with God, are not just sine waves hitting God's ear. It's that he's actually a Ending to what we say. He's considering. He's understanding. He's perceiving. He's doing what? He's listening. He's listening to us when we pray. So we know that he is listening. We don't have to flip a coin. We don't have to wonder. We don't have to speculate. We know that he's listening So we can be sure. We can be sure of what? That he will answer us. We can be sure. Because we know he's listening. We know he's perceiving. We know he's understanding what we're talking about. No matter how you say it, no matter if it's this perfect scripted out prayer or whether it's, you know, kind of starting and stopping and, you know, not the perfect prayer. Even if you just think it, God hears you. He's listening. He understands it. 
Now, for sake of time, we're going to um, skip this. We had talked about that prayer is a conversation, not a performance. It's not like you're on The Voice or American Idol. Or remember what started all those shows back in the day? Come on, the gong show. How many of you remember the gong show? <laughs> where, where, you know, there's somebody out doing their little talent act singing or whatever. And if it wasn't good enough, what did they do? They had the hook, right? And they would hook you and pull you off the stage. It's not like we're performing in front of God, waiting, are we doing good enough, or is he going to hook us and say, I'm not going to listen to you. No, it's not a performance. It's not like God has this, you know, um, I'll give it a 75 so I'll listen to him. You know, he, he's not judging our prayer performance. No, he's wanting to listen to us. So let's, um, whew, let's just skip down to number three. The third pillar is um, God likes to show his grace by answering prayer. See, God is good. Sometimes I think if we could just get that, it would totally revolutionize our theology. If we just got that God is good, like we sang this morning, he's a good, good father. He is good. And he likes to show his goodness by answering prayer. That's why over 20 times in the New Testament, we are commanded to ask things of God. Because he loves answering them. It's part of who he is. And one of the greatest examples, we'll look at more next week, but is James 4, 2. It says, you want things, but you do not have them. So you are ready to kill and are jealous of other people Come on, none of us, right? So you're jealous of other people, but you still cannot get what you want, so you argue and fight. You do not get what you want because you do not ask God. And if we're just honest with ourselves, we know that's true, right? We, we know that our life isn't going you know, as God scripted it, not because God doesn't want it to, but because we don't ask God. We, can we just admit that? That we don't pray like we should? We don't connect with God like we should? But when we do, then God, like that vine, gets things into the branch. When we do connect with God, he can get the things into our life that's going to direct us in the way that he wants us to go. But when we don't, which, come on somebody, we don't. We don't like we should. When we don't, he can't get that to us. So every time we ask something of God, it gives God the opportunity to show how good he is. Now listen, regardless of the answer. Because sometimes we have the answer already pre-scripted, right? We, when we pray, we already have the answer figured out. So if God doesn't do what we already figured out he should do, he didn't answer our prayer. <laughs> God didn't answer our prayer. Because we had already scripted it, but... I think it boils down to, is Jesus really Lord of our lives? Does God know best or do we know best? Is our prescripted answer actually the best for us or does God know better than we do? How many of you have figured out that the answer to your prayers is not 
always yes. <laughs> I, I think we've figured that out both by experience in prayer, but also how many of you, you have kids? And what would your kids be like if you gave them everything they asked for. <laughs> Come on. And we've all seen examples of adults like that, right? That we go, eh, their parents gave them everything they wanted and that's why they're so jacked up. Now, we see examples of that. See, God knows better than that. He's a good, good father. He's the best father. He knows that he can't give us everything we want or we'd be jacked up. So God always, always answers prayer and they fall into these four categories. Yes, no, not yet, or you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> also known as, what in the world were they thinking <laughs> when they asked that? How many of you prayed some prayers like that. you got to be kidding me. But, but the, the answers always fall into these four categories, and we'll talk more about this next week. But as a parent, we've seen our kids not mature enough to tell the difference between no and not yet. How many of you know not yet is not a no, it's just saying it's not the right time for it now. But we've also seen our kids, like say for example, leave in the grocery store and you got some popsicles and they want a popsicle. And you say, no, not yet, you can have one when we get home, but not in the car and then they throw a temper tantrum because they didn't understand the difference between not yet and no. Sometimes we're not mature enough <laughs> to know the difference between not yet and no. And a lot of times we take not yet as no and like that little kid that threw the tantrum, not yet turned in to no, right? Because of the tantrum. So sometimes we miss out on what God wants to do because we don't realize the not yet is not a no, it's a yes down the road. And there's many, many reasons, legit, legitimate reasons why we get these responses. And we'll go over those next week. Let's pray. Father God, we're so thankful, God, that you gave us this amazing ability to communicate with you. God, you didn't like separate yourself. I'm up here and you're down there. God, you came to us so that we can have this amazing connection with you. And God, we're sorry for the times we have not taken advantage of that. And God, our desire is to change that. So God, I pray for each and every person under the sound of my voice, God, that we all pursue that greater connection with you. God, we thank you for it, in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Well, I hope you got something out of that today. Um, we will have a time of fellowship in the back of the church, and um, we'll uh, continue next week with Lord Teach Us to Pray. God bless you. Have a great day.